Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another edition of the Diverse Fight Semantic Layer. Um, we are joined by a return guest and a very well known and esteemed VJ, VJ Sankar. VJ, did I butcher your last name? Um, I, I probably com combined with you or used to my last name being butchered. I hope I got it okay there. Well, you're one of the few people who said it right. Unbelievable. Um, so today we're talking about MongoDB, we're talking unstructured. Um, just a quick little intro to, to VJ. I don't want to sort of let him introduce himself and his role at Mongo, but um, you know, for those who are familiar in the, in the SAP space, VJ is a very well-known person. Um, long con consultancy role in the IBM ranks, then worked for SAP and was the guy who and his team who helped bring you the BW and HANA trials. Um, and then and then did the big jump out of SAP and out of the out of the suits into the world of unstructured in MongoDB. Um, just Wait, from my yeah, and, and no, yeah, exactly. There's no tie, which is phenomenal. Um, sounds like something I could get used to, except, you know. Uh, anyway, let's move on. Uh, so, so from my point of view, I'm I'm a um, as as we all know, enterprise data warehouse person, cyber business objects who ended up in this SAP world, which is a weird and wonderful place. And I just thought, between my background of building data warehouses, BJ's strong background, obviously from the BW aspect, um, this would be the perfect sort of merge of of brains, if you could call it to talk about where unstructured would, would fit in, in, in the SAP enterprise. Now, to be completely honest, I never thought there was a space. And then I saw VJ have his five minutes of fame at TechEd and get on the main stage with MongoDB. And I was like, well, wait a sec. I actually need to go deeper into this. And hence me inviting VJ to educate me and hopefully all of you of where Mongo and where NoSQL and the unstructured databases fit into our SAP landscapes because we the more I get into the SAP world, I realize how insular it is um, in terms of what the technology is. So Vijay, that's probably the longest introduction ever. Um, just in terms of your role now at Mongo, I know you're vice president of many things and have taken on more responsibilities. So just, yeah, one two-minute intro of what you're doing at Mongo. Yeah, yeah, we are a much smaller company than IBM and SAP, so most of us do multiple jobs. Uh, it's not because I'm particularly smart. So in any case, <laughs> I do um, two things at MongoDB. I run our partner business, so our channels, um, working with our SI partners and technology partners like SAP and, and, and so on. And in that capacity, I do get to work very closely with both my ex-employers, IBM and SAP. Um, the other thing that I do is I also run our services business, our uh, consulting business, which is fairly uh, a recent happening as of last month. I've um, also taken over as the GM for uh, consulting. I still code, so I'm, I'm still fairly hands-on. I'm uh, still uh, pretty confident in my abilities to uh, design a mean data warehouse. So uh, yeah, that that's still me. And and probably the coolest business card ever in JSON format, if I recall seeing on Twitter. That that is true. Right? So we have <laughs> the, uh, yeah, this is good. It's all JSON. So, so MongoDB 101 for somebody, you know, generally we've got a, a classic business objects analytics, you know, user base. What is MongoDB and what is NoSQL? Just, just from a from a high level perspective, just to sort of set the tone, and then we can dive deeper. What is MongoDB is an easy uh, easy answer. What is NoSQL is a very complex answer. <laughs> uh, so let's start with what's MongoDB, and hopefully just stick with what's MongoDB without the NoSQL part of it. But so MongoDB is a, is a general purpose database. Right? So um, it started, um, about, the company started about six, seven years ago. Uh, there was this company called DoubleClick um, that you know, served advertisements to uh, internet companies like Google. And Google eventually acquired that company. And the founders of that company, you know, what they figured out was at that scale, the existing databases were not working for them, right? They needed tremendous flexibility and tremendous scalability, and that wasn't working for them with the off-the-shelf software that they could get. So they built their own database. And that uh, essentially continued on to MongoDB, and uh, that's, the, that's the basis of our, uh, of our software. Now, there are two things uh, or three things that we do extremely well. Right? Our core theme is we should make it extremely simple for developers to be, you know, developers should be like productive in no time on, on MongoDB. I know that um, we have fairly succeeded in that given we have 9 million downloads and I think we have like 10 or 12,000 downloads every day. So developers wow. love us. And the reason developers love us is 
there isn't a lot to learn to get started in MongoDB. You can install the software on your Mac um, or your uh, your PC in like ten minutes what's, or less. What's a, what's a PC? <laughs> I don't know if I'm a Mac user now. <laughs> I watched that transition via Twitter as well. It was wonderful. Yes, uh, Sorry. <laughs> it, did, it did take me a while to uh, to get used to it. So, um, so we hold data in, in JSON format, right? Which makes um, it incredibly easy to um, to be agile. So, for example, in the in the data warehouse world, right? You and I both have uh, worked on data warehouses for a long time. It is extremely good and powerful when you know what you're doing. But when you have to make a change, this is also extremely painful. So, you know, as a data warehouse designer. The good ones can second guess most of the questions that a user will want, and we will design a data model um, that satisfies that. And the reason we have to second guess upfront is because once you put a billion rows um, into a table, then changing that schema is not very easy. Right? It's not just one table, right? I mean, there are all the facts yeah. and dimensions to take care of, but it becomes very, very difficult. Whereas in today's world, um, it is kind of the opposite. So you do need um, some reporting that's fairly static and needs real-time response, but an equally important or more important function for developers is the ability to change that report very quickly or change that application very quickly. So that is where you know storing data in MongoDB and our own query language you know uh, shines through. We can make changes very very fast. Because one customer can have, say, two phone numbers, and another customer can have ten phone numbers. One can have one Twitter handle, another can have three Twitter handles. The classic data warehousing way is to find the maximum Twitter handles that somebody can have, and we will have a column for each, and we will leave everything else blank. But this leaves us with the problem that if you have an extra Twitter handle at the, you know, at the 500th customer, then you need to alter the schema, and that causes all kinds of issues. MongoDB lets go of that problem. The 500th customer can look totally different from the 50th customer, and MongoDB doesn't uh, need you to model all, cl all customers the same. So that's a, a, a key difference for us. Jeez, I've got about 100 questions. So, so the first thing that comes to mind when you say you store the, the, the data in JSON format is JSON is quite big in terms of, you know, the, so does that not explode the data volumes and, and the size that you have on disk, or is Mongo written from the ground up to obviously get that information back very quickly? So we do um, uh, write this software, or we did write this software in a, um, with scale out in mind, right? So the way most developers build modern applications is we start small and then we scale horizontally, right? So you start with a commodity server, get it up and running, you know, once the application you know takes legs, then um, you add, you throw in a couple more servers, then uh, maybe ten more servers, hundred more servers, and in that fashion, the classic data warehousing world that I knew had the opposite characteristic, which is you buy, you you second guess demand, right? So you think, okay, my data is going to grow ten uh, x in uh, two years or three years, so let me buy a server that can scale up and catch up with that load. Yeah. And you put in that hardware investment up front. It's not a bad thing, right? I mean, the, the whole construct of the data warehouse is that uh, data will change, but the structure will stay stable for a long time. That is the one principle that is under challenge heavily uh, these days. Yeah. Um, most I, of us... For those who are listening to this audio, I'm laughing because things will stay the same. Is just, yeah. I mean, that's why the waterfall <laughs> approach of data warehouse just doesn't work anymore. Things just yeah, change. exactly, exactly. Exactly. So uh, we um, we very rarely get used in um, waterfall projects. Incidentally, I mean, vast majority, if not all, projects tend to be uh, of the agile nature. For this advantage, right, we are completely built for agile because you can change on the fly. Another very um, interesting developer-friendly thing about MongoDB is we also have this bring your own language paradigm. What what that really means is. Uh, we have supported drivers for most of the popular programming languages, right? There is one for C++, one for uh, Node.js, one for Python, and, and, and so on. And this means that if a developer is already quite productive in Java or JavaScript, um, there is no reason for him to shift to something new 
so some of these databases have its own languages and you know you can only code in those so we want all developers to play with mongodb so we support a lot of drivers there are 10 or 12 drivers that we support directly and probably twice that are on community support so that's another very interesting aspect that a lot of different kinds of developers can get up and running on Mongo very quickly. So that leads to another question. Um, is MongoDB, and I know you refer to application a lot, you know, similar, similar to the whole HANA Enterprise play that SAP are doing with web server, database, and all the other, you know, analytics engines built in and Power. Is Mongo the same where you can write your application sitting on MongoDB with JavaScript with some, some GUI on top as well as the sort of the the SQL that goes down? No, so just the database here? To, to begin with, we don't do SQL. So. What? Oh, our friendship is strained. It's my third language. <laughs> but you can do pretty much everything that you typically do in, with, with SQL on a relational database, um, hopefully in a, in a better way in, um, in Mongo. So, so I have... So can, can we just touch on that point? Sorry. I mean, if, if, if you've got a, a, a good SQL, SQL Server, Oracle, IBM, whatever, um, Sybase IQ, I've got to say that, otherwise it's not a DSLA podcast. If you've got a strong SQL developer, how do you find the, the you know, for them, the, the upskilling across to MongoDB? Because obviously the key for me for, from, a, from a data developer, they understand structures and information rather than the code itself. Yeah. Um, and if they've got that handle of how information sits together, how quick is the transfer? Like someone like me, for example, who's been doing writing SQL for you know, 19 years, how quick would the transition across be to MongoDB? It, it took me very, very little time, right, Clint? I had a very similar background to yours, right? I mean, I wrote SQL for a, for a very, very long time, right? And most of my waking hours were spent thinking of how do I extract that last 2% of performance from relational systems. Um, yeah. It took me very little time to, uh, to change over to Mongo. So the, it, it is mostly a, a question of um, structures looked at differently. So... In, in the classical world, we would nest um, joints, right? I mean, that's how uh, we look at our, uh, our classical relational world. You think of one central table, and then you figure out what are the tables that need to be attached to it. Then you keep looking at queries and find out what are the access patterns that typically hit the database, and then we start tuning. Right? This is yeah. roughly how we do our job. It's more or less the same thing in Mongo 2. If you look at... Um, some of these relational systems that we have built in the past, and, and you look at their query logs, you would most probably find that in a lot of cases, maybe with the exception of data warehouses, um, where you know, things were done in a planned way, in, in a lot of cases what would happen is you would go look at these um, queries and find that it is a very common access pattern to look at data in a deeply nested way. Um, because data is held by multiple foreign key relationships across tables. And then the natural question is, was there a better way of holding that data, which didn't need it to be uh, held in many different tables and, and complex joints? And in many cases, the answer is yes. So the way I like to think about it is, if there are 100 applications on the planet, there are probably 30 in which SQL is the absolute best solution ever, right? Like ERP, um, ERP on HANA or ERP on Oracle or something, right? I mean, those things are written very well optimized for a SQL database. MongoDB doesn't expect to play in that space at all, right? We don't want to go compete in that space. Yeah. For foreseeable future, we don't see ourselves playing in, in that space. There are some other cases like 360 degree view of a customer or one view of enterprise risk where the primary use case is agility. We want to get everything about that customer, but the queries might change all the time, and data will sit in various different formats, right? So rather than unstructured, the way I like to talk about it is um, as multi-structured. So yeah. every record has a different structure, and in those kinds of use cases, MongoDB is much more applicable than SQL. So they will coexist um, just depending on the use case, I just happen to think, or I bet my career on uh, there, there being more MongoDB-friendly use cases than SQL-friendly use cases in future. So this is a, if, if you're an SAP customer, um, and, and what, I, what I'm seeing a lot at the moment is 
is so you know ERP has an investment of BW, BW over the years. Um, a lot of a lot of customers are sort of trying to run third party systems and are wanting to create standalone data warehouses. And a lot of that's happening outside of classic SAP. So within SQL Server, as an example, one of the customers I'm working with at the moment. Would MongoDB in that situation be a good play? Or is that still too structured because it's coming from a from a from a BW system? So MongoDB might be a, a, a fantastic play in those areas. So we don't look at ourselves as a classic OLAP system. Right? We think of ourselves more as an operational analytics system. But that being said, if the primary problem that the customer is trying to solve, if it is to combine data from multiple sources, then MongoDB is probably a much faster, much more efficient way of uh, doing it than a relational system. And the reason for that is quite simple. A customer, just if you look around SAP systems, um, you know, I have worked in CRM and ERP and uh, SRM and, and many other, uh, you know, SAP suite products. They don't all look at customers the same way. Right? How customers modeled in ERP is very different from how it is modeled in CRM. Same with product and many other master data objects. Uh, same deal with transactions, right? Different frameworks and so on. Yeah. The classic way to uh, model it in SAP to get one view across um, these suite systems was to dump it into VW. Or you write some, or you dump it into HANA and then um, you ETL them and, and make them look all right. These are all viable approaches, right? I mean, nothing against it. Right? I will never say anything bad about HANA. I treat it just as my baby as Mongo is, right? So, uh, but it serves that purpose. What does pose a certain problem is what when the data model changes? What when you also want to bring out your mainframe based claims information into ERP, right? Into, into uh, this data warehouse and combine it with ERP. That is when things become really difficult in the relational world because you need to ETL it and redesign your schema and so on. Whereas with Mongo, it is really easy. You can say that give me all customers whose first name starts with John. Or Clint, and instead of you know making everything 18 characters and um, you know put leading uh, zeros and so on, right? We used to do a lot of uh, such things to make data look the same. We don't need to do such things in Mongo. So it, you can be up and running very very quickly. Like for example, MetLife, the insurance company, they could combine tens of policy systems into one view of customer called a very famous project called the Wall project. They could do that in less than three months all the way to production, right? From day one to production, they could do it in three months, which in classic data warehousing world with 70 source systems, uh, probably it's pretty tough to, uh, to make it happen in three months, right? Probably not, not possible. No, no. Um, okay, so, so a, couple, a couple of questions of that. Firstly, how do you handle dates? Because if you've worked in data warehouse or in ETL, dates are always a nightmare, and you always spend hours and with date formatting. Is Mongo sort of approach that in a more generic way? Yeah, we have a. Because uh, if anybody's worked in a data warehouse, you always have issues with dates. I mean. Yes, but this is also because in data warehouse we create some artificial constraints on ourselves by. Thinking about time dimension in a in a very specific way, Mongo is a is a lot more flexible, has um, specific yep. modeling paradigms for time series data, which um, it, there are pros and cons for this thing, right? So, for example, if you want to optimize uh, a certain axis pattern where your um, indexes and your uh, your structure is going to stay the same, um, and if you need to optimize in that fashion, probably the data warehouse way of modeling it is more easy. But if you're constantly switching around from day to second to year to month, you know, in that fashion, if your queries are of that nature, then modeling the time series in MongoDB is probably the, the smart thing to do. From, from the design philosophy, let's look at MetLife. Now, if you, if you look at the way data warehousing world, there's a, you know, the data warehouse 2.0 where you bring, well, I think it's another word I've used called data vault where you, you basically dump all your transactional systems in ODSs in your data warehouse and then you model from there so you've got access to all the data. Is my understanding of Mongo, you, you pretty much put everything in that ODS layer or I think the DSO layer for the BW people and then you just work off that. There are no 
tiers above that where you've got to create a star schema or a relational schema, um, you come off that bottom ODS layer. Is that, is that about right? Correct, except we don't need the star schema. Everything else kind of holds true for Mongo. So you could have multiple um, ODS-like structures, yep. and then you write query against our collections, right? It's like tables. So yeah, very similar concept, except we don't really need the, the star schema. And you can just keep changing the schema, you know, as you go. Yeah. So for the for the for the for the SAP people who are completely confused about what we're talking about, it's it's pretty much the same concept of what SAP is selling with Hannah now, where you've got to store the the, the the data once and then create virtual analytical calc views on top and not actually aggregate and store the data. It's a similar concept. So hopefully that'll you know, from a more SAP speak, uh, makes sense. Is that that is right, eh, Vijay? Uh, yes, but I also wanted to um, add a point. I mean, we, <laughs> I mean, when you and I started uh, being data warehouse engineers, the the big difficulty in the world was storage was very expensive. It, uh, that is not the the biggest expense today. The biggest expense today is actually developer productivity. Right? Salaries and other expense have increased quite a bit, and developers don't have that. Forget developers. Business yep. doesn't have a huge lot of patience. In in the 90s, I could totally walk up to a business user and say that, okay, this change will take three months, and he wouldn't fight me. Whereas if I go to a business user and say now that, okay, your requested change to alter two fields is going to take three months, you'll probably find somebody else who can do it in three days. Yeah. So those things... Um, Data warehousing world has some ways to go to fix it, and many of them are fixing it, right? Like um, some of the data warehouses have now native JSON support to work with uh, JSON-like structures. So uh, there are uh, moves from the data warehouse uh, community or uh, of vendors to uh, adapt to this, but the world that all these principles were created that you and I hold dear to heart for, for a long time, uh, the, the truth of the matter is those fundamentals have changed significantly from the time we started and, and today. Yeah, I still remember having a, a debate with a customer where, where we were using IQ, and obviously it was in columns, so it stored the data in bits and bytes, and, and said, well, have you ever really analyzed relational database structures and why the keys were created? And the keys were created by, I think it was by IBM many, many years ago because of performance issues. Yeah. So in, in a... In IQ, because it did the compression for them, instead of storing like a customer ID, I actually put the customer number because it was easier from a data warehouse perspective to get the data out. And that freaked the customer out. They're like, "Well, why are you doing that?" I said, "Well, we don't need to store it in bits and bytes because, because you know, the database engine does that for me. But it's so much more legible and easier for you to do analytics if it's." And and we had this debate, and they, they were never very comfortable with it because it, you know, as you said, the way you store data relationally was just the way it was done. But that. That was goes back to the seventies where you know databases ran slowly. You know, so it's, yeah, I, I exactly. hear you. Yeah, there are uh, some principles that are still applicable. You know, like for example, if you need to optimize a query, you cannot just trust on the primary key to do that. You will typically need secondary keys, right, to yeah. uh, secondary indexes to to make it work. So MongoDB supports the notion of secondary indexes, right? So we can intersect across multiple indexes and. Um, get our performance better. So there are those kinds of things that we do really well. And also we coexist pretty neatly with data warehouses, like taking, for example, Teradata as, a, as an example, or Hadoop as an example. We have connectors that can push data into uh, a data warehouse, you know, get MapReduce or whatever it is that the data warehouse does, yep. get, the, get the information back, and update MongoDB with that, right? So... There are those things that the data, data warehouse does really well. MongoDB has no intention of replacing that with MongoDB. We would much rather coexist in a, in a, in a way that the customer-facing application sits on MongoDB, and then if you need to do something like get a recommendation or if you want to like segment customers or something that needs a lot of data, you push it with a connector, a bidirectional connector. You push it into uh, Teradata or to uh, Hadoop, get the map reduce done there, pull back the information, update it in MongoDB so that the user feels that everything is happening in one system. Okay, so the, so the deep data mining is not, not a play you after? Uh, no, not in the sense that Data Warehouse looks at it, no. Okay, 
Okay. So from a from a from a from a GUI point of view, from a front end perspective, what are your what are your customers using? Can it use the classic, you know, business objects or the Cognos or, or is it you know front what, what front end applications generally connect in MongoDB um, in your in your experience so far? Well, the SAP uh, community who probably is uh, you know largely watching this, Lumira is one of those front ends. Right. Yeah. So that's what we announced at uh, TechEd, and you can also use SAP's data services to move the data back and forth between MongoDB and the data warehouse. So that's that's definitely one. Uh, Pentaho, JasperSoft, there are other BI tools that that work, and we are working with many other BI vendors. We are also working with the driver vendors to um, certify drivers so that other BI tools can connect in a, in a standardized way. Right. So in a the next few months, we should be announcing more and more of those. So, so generally, I mean, you know, for anybody connecting to a database, it was ODBC or JDBC. I'm assuming you're using a different driver which handles the JSON format coming back out of Mongo. Is that, is that so, the differentiator? Yeah. So, JDBC and ODBC um, drivers already exist today in the market that can, um, you know, connect a BI tool to MongoDB. Okay. Uh, some of them are. Um, not particularly useful for Mongo in the sense that they flatten out our deeply nested structure into into a flat string, um, which is great for the BI client, but um, it also loses the fidelity of the data underneath. So the, the, it needs a more native kind of um, integration. So the driver driver vendors are working with us to certify newer generation of their drivers that are optimized for MongoDB. Brilliant. Um, looking forward, I mean, I know how long you've been in the role? Six months, if that long? Uh, close, to, close to nine months now, you know, believe wow. it or not. Yeah. Where, where did that happen? Um, yeah. what's, what's been your the most exciting thing for you besides not wearing a tie? Uh, you know, coming, coming into a very suit-like structured world, going into MongoDB, what has been for you the most exciting thing? Oh yeah, I have probably worn a, a tie and suit like two times in the last nine months. <laughs> super duper awesome. Uh, no, what what excites me the most is how fast we can get through projects. A lot of projects where it would have taken me six weeks to just get through an RFP response, right? Writing up an SOW and, and doing contract negotiation, I can get through an entire project in that time. Yeah. Because of this flexibility that uh, MongoDB provides, that excites me more than anything else, right? This you don't you don't like paperwork? Come on! <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good at paperwork, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like an optimized robot when it comes to paperwork. Yeah, we, when you said RFP, I just cringed. Like, oh, it's like I hear you. Yeah, it's it's a it's a necessary part of doing business. Yeah, indeed it is. And and for 2015, any big plans for Mongo that you can release that you won't get fired for? Um, I know you've probably flown more miles than an astronaut this year. A lot of travel, or, or what? What? What are your plan? What are the plans for Mongo and yourself for 2015? I was looking at my frequent flyer statement, and between <laughs> last December and this December, uh, a few hundred thousand miles that I have flown, and that's a little bit on the crazy side. It doesn't look like. Uh, 2015 is going to be much different, so I, I'll be on the, on a plane quite a bit. Um, still haven't come to Australia, so I'm uh, definitely planning a visit. We need we need to fix that. I'll get you surfing. That's 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 the pledge I have to everybody who comes to visit me. Yes. So um, yeah, what what is exciting coming up? Uh, we have a lot of product announcements coming up. We have a lot of um, alliances with top companies in the world coming up that will get announced in the next few months, right? We have a really large ecosystem. We have 750 partners. I don't think wow. there is another, uh, you know, uh, modern database out there that has 750 partners. And we are growing extremely aggressively, our partner ecosystem. And many of them we go really deep in, so you, you will hear a lot more about that. On June 1st and 2nd next year in uh, Midtown, New York, uh, we will have MongoDB World, our uh, big user conference. Uh, we had it last year in, or rather this year in, in New York as well. So yeah. that is something that I would love for you folks to uh, to come have a uh, have a fun time. You will meet all our customers, and it, it, it's a lot of fun. I mean, that's one of the most fun events I have ever been. It's 
completely different from the large company setup. So, so June the second, I turned forty. So may, may, maybe a little trip to New York wouldn't be too bad. Uh, I will I will turn forty uh, a couple of months before that. So <laughs> you're also a seventy five child. <laughs> and um, the other uh, thing, if I could put in a little plug here, is uh, I also run our consulting uh, team, and I'm looking for smart consultants in uh, Europe and North America. So. Uh, if any of you want to uh, try your hand at being a top MongoDB consultant, yeah, we have uh, we have opportunities. We'd love to uh, to talk to you. So, what kind of background are you looking for? You're looking for the SQL guy, the JavaScript guy, um, data warehouse guy, BW guy. You know, generally, what what sort of so what skills are you looking for? Definitely needs need to understand large data, right? I mean, sophisticated, complex data. Whether that is in the in the form of being a programmer or a data warehouse person, I don't particularly worry, because people should have a feel for data, right? Those structures. How do you optimize access to those structures? The actual data in itself, actual technology used to uh, manipulate it, whether it's SQL or uh, something else, is of uh, less importance to me, right? People who have good customer-facing skills who can Ask the right questions and so on. That is way more important. Technology is something that you can pick up, and Mongo is an easy enough technology. Yeah, it's tough for me to teach someone is uh, how to how to face a customer. So people who are really good at customer facing uh, situations, but who also have um, experience with dealing with large complex data, whether it is as an application developer or as a data warehousing consultant, uh, would be fantastic. My email ID is vj at mongodb.com. So that is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me or tweet me, Vijay Shankar V, uh, on Twitter. We will put it all up in the show notes so people can get hold of you. Um, you, you know, in terms of the data thing, when, when I ran my company in South Africa, the first thing I did was a guy came in as ETL, back end, front end. I put them through a SQL test. And if they yeah. passed that, then I'd hire them. And I wouldn't care if, even if it was my SQL or whatever it was, as long as they understood data structures and how information sat together. You know, technology is an enabler. You know, you, they all as what you can learn different sets of tech. Absolutely. Um, but you, you can't learn how information sits together. And if you've got that, you can learn anything. That was always my um exactly. My take. Exactly. Can't completely. So amen on that one. Uh, just a quick one from a, 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 as nerds, we stay away from cost. But where if people want to find out more about MongoDB, they want to get it up and running. Obviously, you know, from I know it's free, but how does it work? Do they engage with you? Do they engage with SIs? Do they download it? Is there enterprise cost? Just, just to sort of, you know, put a bow on on the MongoDB offering. Sure. So we have two versions of our product, right? We have a, a community version and an enterprise version. The community version is free, and enterprise version is paid. So the enterprise, what they are very similar except for enterprise grade features. So for somebody to run a mission critical system on MongoDB. It is not just enough to have good query performance and good scale out and so on. You also need good ways of monitoring it, good ways of backing it up, good ways to audit it, right? Kerberos integration, right? Security yeah. and yeah. and so on. And then you also need enterprise grade support, right? You definitely don't want to be telling your boss that okay, my system just died. I have put an entry into uh, a forum. And let's see what everybody says, right? So that that doesn't really work out in uh, in practice. So the CIOs we, don't like that. <laughs> it's not good for job security. No, it, it definitely is not. It's a, it's a terrible idea. I wouldn't do it <laughs> if I was held responsible for the system. So that's uh, that's the paid version of MongoDB. Now, without uh, discussing actual prices, we are like orders of magnitude uh, cheaper than most other databases. We are definitely way cheaper than the big uh, you know, appliances out there today, right? Much, much cheaper than that. But exactly. it is a right. factor of um, factor of value. Right? We can get a lot of customers up and running quickly on lower hardware, very cloud friendly. You know, vast majority of our business are cloud systems, right? Where people spin up on the cloud and scale horizontally. So there, there are a lot of good reasons why uh, this is very easy to get started and running really quickly. And is that pricing on CPU or data volumes, or how does that work? Uh, on RAM. So uh, half terabyte, 512 uh, gigs of RAM is what we consider one unit. Okay, great. 
Um, and in terms of engaging, like if, if people want to get started, I'm assuming there's a lot of collateral online or the tutorials. If oh. they want to, if they want to take it to the enterprise, do they engage with you, the services team, SIs, or or, or what's the best part? There are many different ways of doing it. So getting on getting onto MongoDB.com, um, you can download our enterprise um, version. Uh, you could talk to us if you need a consultant to help. Right, the Vijay at MongoDB.com is a easy way to get a hold of me. We can help you with that. Um, we also have, um, you know, um, partners. Right, we have 750 partners, so we can help you uh, be put in touch with a partner in your area who focuses on, um, you know, your particular niche, be it geography, language, or industry vertical, and so on. So, if you shoot a note at uh, Partners at MongoDB.com. That is another way uh, you can get uh, get help. But um, the easiest is to come to our website, put in um, you know three or four fields into a form, and somebody will call you back. We are we are very responsive. We are a, a much smaller company, so we definitely appreciate the business. Excellent. VJ, any other closing thoughts before we? I know we are over our time. Before we wrap up, any any plans Hi. for the first of season? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm planning to take a few days off for Christmas, visit my sister in Dallas, and 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 stuff like that. And um, Clint, thank thank you. This was awesome. Uh, great catching up with you, and I appreciate the opportunity to be on uh, DS Laird. Sure, thanks, but I didn't get to see you on Tech Ed because I think you were in the VIP booth at the back. Oh no, which, uh, <laughs> which us normal folk don't get to see. But uh, thanks so much for your time, VJ. It's it's been informative as ever. Um, I, I hope the travel calms down, and uh, you know I look forward to personally downloading MongoDB and, and chatting about partnering with you guys. It sounds exactly where I need to be playing it. I am waiting for EV Technologies to sign up as a MongoDB partner. <laughs> we will indeed. Thanks, VJ. Thank you. This podcast is hosted and sponsored by EV Technologies. Visit us on the net at savethecms.com. Peace, Slayer!